now. So hello and welcome comic book fans and thank you as always for joining me. Today is a very special day because on Comic Conversations, I have the privilege to be speaking with one of the most prolific creators currently in the business of making comics. He's penned nearly every single major DC character you can imagine from Batman to Martian Manhunter. This past year alone, he's released his creator-owned series, Commanders in Crisis, as well as the original graphic novel, To Kill a Man. And he is the self-described Steve Orlando of comics. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to welcome Steve Orlando to Comic Conversations. Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk. Oh, so, so excited to be able to speak with you here today. So how are things going in your world? Just before we kind of kick into things, how are things in, uh, how are things in Boston going? Uh, you know, they're busy. Uh, like anyone, I think we're reaching well beyond the cabin fever uh, level, uh, level of lockdown. But at least for being a freelancer, this was less of a change than for other people. You know, I was already working from home. I was already ordering my groceries to my house uh, out of laziness. But now it just seems like I was doing it out of foresight, uh, which is nice. But yeah, I mean, it, I've been hustling all last year. I've been hustling this year. I'm very lucky that life for this industry has largely been unchanged. Um, but you know, just got to keep, just got to keep working. Uh, comics largely hasn't stopped moving. Uh, there's been some changes. Um, weirdly, been some good changes as well. And the fact that with all of us being stuck in. Um, it's kind of been a great equalizer in the creative field in some ways. You're never that guy on a video call while someone else is in the room pitching something because everybody's on a video call. So it's, it's, it's been a transformative 18 months for sure, but we're, uh, we're still in it. And me, I specifically am, am well beyond still in it. Well, to say the least, I think you might hold the current title for busiest man in comics at the moment, because it seems like every other you know day that I'm opening up my computer, I'm seeing some news article pop up with your name associated with it, which is just fantastic. So we've got a lot to discuss, and I just have so much that I kind of want to pick your brain about. So I apologize if it comes off as a little bit frantic or if we're jumping around. But I figured a great place to start and kind of what originally brought us here today is I'd love to kind of begin by delving into Commanders in Crisis, if that's okay with you. Sure. So just to kind of kick things off, and I, I hate to use the phrase elevator pitch, but for anyone who may be listening or watching who might not be familiar with the book, what can you kind of tell us or tell those people who, who may not have picked up issue one just yet? I mean... Commanders in Crisis is, uh, it's a, it is a dyed in the wool uh, superhero comic. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's for fans who have loved superheroes and, and want to be proud of what they do and who they are. But at its core, it's about five people who've undergone massive failure. They're former presidents of the United States in their worlds of the multiverse, and they couldn't save their worlds. Uh, and so they've come here to ours, the last reality left, uh, to try to salvage it against this threat that's coming. So, you know, it is, while there's a lot of strange uh, and, and creative things going on in the book, at its core, it's about five people, uh, you know, with going for one last shot to save the world and, and make up for the failures of their career. They thought they had power, whether it was, you know, just being uh, public figures, whether it was being pre the president, and, and everything they thought wasn't enough everything they thought would give them the power to help people wasn't enough to save their world. So now they're here to try to think about things a different way, to try to save the world a different way. And they've got no other choice because this is the last world left. Our world is the last world left. And I think what I found really interesting or enticing about this book is you kind of are almost working in, in reverse. You kind of began this universe with this mega level crisis event with all of these different characters who have their own respective stories and arcs, but you kind of are essentially going right from the get-go of I'm going to start with this massive event and then we're going to kind of work in reverse, so to speak. So I guess sort of the question that I wanted to ask is why was the choice to go about it that way? Like, was that at all daunting for you? Were you used to kind of working with kind of mega events prior or did you just kind of want to kind of reinvent the wheel so to speak 
I mean, I had done an event with uh, Milk Wars uh, that I wrote with and show run with Gerard Way a couple years ago. Uh, that crossed over Young Animal in the DC Universe with uh, his book, um, Doom Patrol, and my book, Justice League of America, as the sort of front runners for that. So I'd done that and I loved, I mean, that was as close as I'd gotten to the strange superheroes that made me love comics. Uh, at least at that time, I'd since done Martian Manhunter, which was definitely in that vein. And so now, uh, you know, when I'd gone freelance, yeah, I wanted to completely take the training wheels off and completely take the, the, the bumpers off of the, the bowling alley or whatever other, you know, metaphor you want to use uh, and, and, and do a big, wild uh, superhero event um, that welcomed people into a world, but also was really about something uh, and really looked at a lot of the tropes that we've grown up with and, and read for years and years and take it for granted. Uh, and tried to offer you a new look at them and, and make you think about them in a new way. So um, it was born definitely out of my experiences at DC. Everything I learned there, uh, which was a lot, which was so much. Uh, and then also, you know, the ability to now have the freedom to work with characters that aren't connected to billion dollar, you know, media media conglomerates and things like that, which is not a knock, but there are different rules when you're working on something that's on lunch boxes and shoes and that take your pick uh, versus something that is just going to have to appear in this comic and not owe to all these other things. So I wanted to make the best use of my freedom creatively I could now that I was out and, and tell something big that felt like the books of the, I mean, for me, the books that made me love comics, which is uh, the wildness of the Silver Age with like the, the subversive um, thoughtfulness of the, of, of the 90s, of, of Grant's Doom Patrol, of Flex Mentello, the things that got me in uh, and try to do that for a new generation. So we're, we're doing it. It's always going to give you more new ideas per page than any other book <laughs> in, the, in the market. And um, I want it to feel sort of like very unique. The storytelling is not like modern most modern comics, it's very compressed. A lot happens in every issue. A lot of new ideas happen in every issue. And I'm proud of that. Some other things I do are in more traditional storytelling styles and I love doing that too, but it's about having the freedom to do them all. Uh, and, and that's what happens uh, since I went freelance last year. So I was gonna go all in, or rather when I decided I was gonna go all in, I had to really own up to that and, mm -hmm. and get everything I could out of it. Now, one thing that I certainly noticed right away from probably, I guess, the third issue um, is that I kind of got the feeling that this could very easily be a, a continuing or ongoing series. There's a million and one kind of countless possibilities that you could branch out with with any one of those characters. So why was it that you chose to go right from the start to make the decision to make this a 12 issue limited series? I mean, realistically, as a creator in the modern market, you are lucky to get 12 issues on anything that isn't a company book. So it was more about, you know, I we could always come back to it, yep. but I didn't want to have something be open-ended for readers and maybe not complete and, and, and leave them hanging. Um, so going for 12 was a big aim uh, in the modern comics market, for better or worse. Um, but we wanted to do that. And, and again, wanted to be sure that people got a full story. Uh, if it was ongoing, there's always the chance that, yeah, we maybe have to tie things up earlier than we wanted to or things like that. I'd much rather tell something complete and come back in a year or two years uh, than leave people hanging forever. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's very important to me. If you're committed to the series, you should be getting a real ending uh, you know, with teases for the future, but you should be getting something complete. That's, I feel, my responsibility as a creator. For sure. No, I, and I completely understand kind of wanting to make sure that the closure was there and that the audience knew that that's what they were going to be getting. I think another thing that really kind of fascinated me right from the get-go is before I read the book, I didn't realize, and I never really questioned how boring traditional superpowers are, flight <laughs> and, and super strength. And now you're throwing characters who, you know, can can reinvent the fabric of time and metaphysics with 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 words. You've got X-ray vision, a prize fighter who's only as strong as the crowd thinks that he is. So where did where did that come from? Where did you where do you get those kind of ideas for superpowers? I mean, 
Well, first of all, I think any power is only as boring as, you know, excuse me, the creators behind it, which is not a specific dig at anyone else. I just don't think there's any bad character, or any bad power set. It's our job to make them interesting. So, you know, that said, the, the books that I got into loving comics for had people with strange powers. I mentioned Flex Mentello. I mean, Muscle Mystery is about the weirdest power out there. Um, and when I, I mean, the, the closest antecedent to this book is probably like the Tom Rainey era of Stormwatch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was an era that debuted Jenny Sparks, who has a more traditional power, but a, a, a less traditional backstory. But it also debuted Jack Hawksmore at the time, who had one of the most unique superpowers that ever come across, you know. Uh, and so we wanted to pay homage to that. And yeah, like the team doesn't have the traditional superpowers. But again, that's those are the things that made me think about comics in a new way when I got in. So I'm hoping folks pick this up now and, and, and they do the same thing. No, and I, and I completely agree. And, and another thing that I really liked about um, all of the characters in the book is that their powers are also kind of balanced with this fragility or this vulnerability, I, I guess is maybe a better word. You know, you're, you've got someone with super strength, but he's only as strong as the people around him believe him to be. You have someone who can literally look into another human's body and, and tell them what's wrong with their ailments, their sicknesses, their injuries, but doesn't possess the know-how of like a physician to be able to actually fix this. And I really think that that's one thing that we get a lot about is the, the heroes are always being shown as being super, but we never really get to see how they kind of act or interact when they're unable to help. And I really thought that that was just something that I enjoyed uh, from, from your writing and, and from your perspective. Well, that's going to continue. Uh, you know, they're going to get it wrong a lot, but I think that that's because, um, I mean, it's, it, it's in my mind. It's in my personal, my personal uh, sort of thought processes are all built around that right now uh, because a lot of what we thought was working in the world hasn't been working. So it's a similar thing. And, and, and that journey of, how to actually accomplish the goal that they want to, which is to keep this, keep this last earth alive. Yeah. They're going to get it wrong. Uh, and, and they're going to continue to, and they're going to have to continue to reevaluate the way they think about things. Um, and it might seem like, Oh, who wants to read a book about superheroes who don't have all the answers, but we don't have all the answers. So we should be looking, you know, it's a false, I mean, it's false to look up to these characters and find them aspirational if they never make mistakes and they never get things wrong because the real actual thing that's aspirational is admitting when you're getting it wrong and finding a new way. So yeah, it's going to be continue to be untraditional, but, and man, the ending super is, but that's kind of the point to me. Like if they just came in and, and, and from the multiverse and saved us, uh, you know, the way that they see fit, what have we learned? What have we thought about as readers? Uh, you know, I, I want to do something bigger and hopefully more transformative than that. And will we stick to landing? I don't know. I, a lot of my favorite works are messy. Flex Mantello is messy as hell, but it's different and it's thought provoking. And that above all is my goal. Mm -hmm. I also read um, in, in an interview that you gave that when you had begun the process of writing this book, some of the ideas um like, for example, the idea of America breaking into 52 separate states initially seemed a little bit out there. And as the kind of political climate of 2020 evolved, it then became something that all of a sudden seemed not only plausible, but possible. And I guess I was wondering how much changed from concept to kind of where we are now, given the influence of the last 12 months? Well, I mean, I'm only on issue nine right now, uh, other than the outline. I mean, I know how it ends. Mm -hmm. uh, so the nice thing is I tend to leave things pretty liquid. The character arcs aren't necessarily liquid because you have to make sure you have emotional payoffs and things like that. But the plot, um, how they get from A to B, I, I purposely, because of everything you just said, left relatively liquid. Um, which is not to say I'm just flying by the seat of my pants. I'm, we're still working six months ahead. So it's not mm -hmm. as though I, we're, we're, in a, we're rushing to make things make sense. But 
I will say the ending that I had planned in issue one um, is vastly different uh, than, I mean, again, the A to B is still there. The team is going to find what I think the version of victory you could possibly find is, but what that is has changed greatly. And it has to, you know, uh, and it's become more interesting. It might be more surprising to people too. Um, but again, like my thought process in many ways for the past 12 months has been what these people are going through. These, these, uh, characters are going through. Um, and it'd been a lot about how we sort of think about power, how we think about helping people, um, how we think about, um, charity, uh, you know, I, I, I'm friends with uh, Jose Andres, uh, who's up for the Humanitarian of the Year Award. And a big quote that he talks about, and I'm going to butcher it, is that um, I can't even I can't even say it as eloquently as him. But the charity isn't about the charity isn't about the the like isn't supposed to be beneficial to the giver. It's supposed to liberate the receiver. Uh, and so working with him and thinking about that this year has really made me think about how these superheroes act um, and how they, what it really means if they just come in and bulldoze their way into a community and do everything their way and say, well, now you're saved and zip off. Um, I don't know if that really works in the 2021, 2020 context, at least in a world where I'm in complete creative control so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's had to change, but I built the story. I built the plot to change while making sure that the character arcs are going to be satisfying. Now, I kind of want to, if we can, just take a little bit of a left turn here, because not only in Commanders in Crisis are you kind of, I don't want to say reinventing, but definitely going about the idea of what it means to be a superhero from a different perspective. And a lot of that has to do with the portrayal and the inclusion of queer characters in your writing. And I think that when I, when I think of someone like you, who is kind of balancing on, on one hand, I, I would sure you have people who, you know, like me, who come up to you and are like, hey, you know, I love your writing. You know, you're one of my favorite creators, blah, blah, blah. But you also, I would presume, have a certain section or portion of your audience who are speaking to you because you're writing characters and you're telling stories that identify with their experiences, their sexuality, whatever you want to call it. And I guess the question that I'm kind of coming around to is, do you ever feel the pressure of balancing being a role model within the queer community and just being a creator? I mean, I'm not a role model. Look at me. I'm a mess. Uh, but <laughs> nobody wants to be like me. They should probably shave, you know, but um, look, I mean, the thing is, is you can't be, I mean, first of all, it's been nice because since I've gotten in, there's more and more career creators coming up uh, and breaking in and coming through. And to me, the pressure has, I mean, the answer to this really hasn't changed since I got into comics because there's more of us, but the reality is the only fair pressure is to tell authentic stories. Uh, if you put too much on your shoulders, you end up trying to tell a story that is everything to everyone. And then what you get is something that is meaningful to absolutely no one because it's so surface level. And so you can't necessarily tell the, there is no, in the case of queer representation, there is no like, thought like chthonic queer story that is, is everyone's tale. So honestly, I've never tried to do that. I can't speak for other creators, but what I do try to do is create a diverse array of authentic characters and continue to do it. That's what the pressure is, is to continue to serve both the needs of a story and the needs of the community. Um, but you still always have to serve the needs of a story first. Otherwise, even we are guilty of tokenism. Uh, so authenticity uh, and then uh, repeated creation. To me, that's that's the real pressure. Uh, and that's the fair pressure that should be put on us. You know, like when I worked on Midnighter, his story was just going to be one gay superhero story. Otherwise, uh, again, you're just going to get generic vanilla crap. And we deserve better than that. You know, so the key is to just keep doing what I hopefully do well. Um and telling stories that are appealing not just to the queer community, but to the world as a whole. 
and do that as I hold up more creators and, and help more people get in and tell their stories and, and, and keep their authentic storytelling going. You know, we've had, we featured uh, a widely diverse array of cover artists on, on Commanders in Crisis because I want to feature new and different creators. Uh, and the, uh, I mean, I'm also co-writing with a new uh, non-binary creator that is a friend of mine on Commanders in Crisis 8. You know, the work isn't just, we can't do it all. No one creator can do it all, nor should we, um, because there's things that are outside my lane. So yeah, the pressure is there, but you, I feel like it's less than if you really think, you know, if your ego is such that you think you're the queer creator, I mean, good for you, but <laughs> it's foolish. Uh, and it, and it's foolhardy because you're just setting yourself up for failure there. All, all I ever try to be is one authentic voice as I try to lift up others. Uh, and, you know, hopefully I do that. No, and I, and I think that that's a great way of putting it. And, you know, certainly from my perspective, I would say that you're succeeding. And just based on kind of what we've discussed there, now seems like an absolute perfect time to just kind of pivot right into uh, To Kill a Man. Sure. Um, because, um, you know, I, I think that 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 book has so much of what you were just talking about, kind of a a reconciliation of of telling these these stories and and having inclusion be a part of it but also making sure that the story itself is is worth telling and not just letting that overshadow the actual plot points itself so is to kill a man kind of the the queer community's rocky is that how you would describe it my hope, that's my hope, you know, I mean, and, and also, I mean, it's the queer community's Rocky and it's the mixed martial arts community's Moonlight, you know, because yeah. I, I wrote, the reason I wrote that with Philip Kennedy Johnson, Philip Kennedy Johnson, he's definitely a Philip, uh, is I wanted that not to be, I wanted that to, of course, appeal to queer readers, but I also wanted to appeal to mixed martial arts readers and try to bring some communities together that maybe think they don't have a lot in common, uh, you know? So yes, that is the hope for that because I wanted that as a young reader uh, and didn't have it. But the goal also there, I mean, that that's a perfect example. You know, it, it wasn't just, in, which is not to say that mixed martial arts <laughs> readers are a marginalized community. But I wanted to bring people together that maybe wouldn't see a commonality before. And that's why I worked with Phil, uh, Philip, uh, you know, to make sure that the fighting aspects of it are just as authentic as the queer aspects of it. Uh, and I'm really proud of what we did in that book because there were times when I would say to Philip, you know, you're getting a little too heavy into jargon here. I think that people are, you're gonna start, you're gonna start losing people. And likewise, you know, there were things that I thought were important for the book and everything when it comes to queer experience and they all got in, but we spent a lot of time talking about how they got in, in a way that would still be welcoming, that would be true to queer readers, but also still be welcoming to people who, you know, are with, from without the experience. Uh, what's the rating on this podcast, by the way? Oh, you can say, swear, yeah, whatever so, you, you like. Know, it's like. It's like the different, yeah, I'm just saying, you know, like you want people, to, when you want people to empathize, um, there are things that are a norm for, uh, for us that maybe aren't for them. And it's about saying things the right way, you know, like I, I can think of ridiculous examples, but like the, the difference between like the difference of how we talk about <laughs> whether or not someone has douched or not, you know, like, I, I like, I mean, take your pick. There's a way that will shock people. And like, I will get a snicker out of that, but maybe they don't come back and finish the book. And there's a mm -hmm. way that still makes it true. And they realize, Oh, that's a part of that culture that I didn't even know happened, which mm -hmm. for the majority of straight people probably don't. Um, and they're still in and rather than being driven away, they find a way to empathize with it. So we did that a lot in that book and I'm very proud of it because we do get, we, we, I mean, we go on mixed martial arts podcasts and they've never read a, a gay book before. Uh, and likewise, uh, many of my readers have never given a shit about a sports book before. And, mm -hmm. and that, that is the type of things I want to do, at least with the work that I create. And I think that that's a great way of looking at it. And that was another thing that I wanted to speak to you about too, is when you look at these kind of like mixed martial arts is a great example. Football is a great example. These kind of stereotypical arenas that are bent on kind of historically perpetuating a kind of hyper masculinity. What steps need to be taken or what steps do you think can we as a community take that will help 
make it so that there isn't a stigma of and like you said, an MA, I'm an MMA fighter reading a queer book, um, a queer person going to to a cage fight. Is it is it just the conversation that needs to be kind of kept up, or is there more that we can be doing? Do you think? I mean, it's complicated. Um, I mean, to be clear, like it is not on the queer community to do the emotional work to get mixed martial arts fans to see that they're toxic and that we're human. Uh, you know. But that said, so I'm, I'm not worried about that, but mm -hmm. uh, per se, like, uh, because in general, like, yeah, there's work to do in that sport and it will be, you know, it, it will be done as more and more folks uh, speak their truth from within the sport. But as fans, I mean, the only work I think we have to do is, you know, if we like those things, be, be willing to be willing to step away and, and find some individuality within the, the queer community. Uh, you know, if you like those things, you should be proud to like those things, whether or not they're a traditionally queer thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, but the work is not, it's not like we need like, Oh, if you like mixed martial arts, you got to go, you got to go to fight night. Uh, and even if people don't want you there, like you got to stick it out. Like, no, like that's the, the emotional labor is not on us when it comes to <laughs> our fans, of a given sport that is traditionally somewhat toxic um, towards the queer community. But as to changing opinions, if you like things, I think you should be not afraid to say them. I mean, I like a lot of things that other queer folks traditionally don't, and I'm careful to say traditionally because there is no like one culture. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of things that I'm personally not into and I'm not, I don't vilify them. Uh, and there's, you know, plenty of people that bust my chops about liking things that are not generally things that, that queer people like, but what we should do is norm normalize uh, that there is no, like, again, there is no one or culture. Uh, if you love sleeping with guys and you also love football, then you should be able to like those two things mm -hmm. and not, and not really sort of couch, be couch, you know, couched about it uh, amongst the, amongst your friends. Um, you know, and I guess that's the work we have to do. Like we mm -hmm. shouldn't, we shouldn't, but I, I don't think that it's like our job <laughs> to, uh, to show, you know, sports fans that we belong there. I mean, if you want to go, uh, then you should go. But I do think that, yeah, like we should also not be worried about performing a certain type of queer culture. Mm -hmm. Um, because our only obligation is to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about living your truth when it comes to your sexuality or your gender identity or, or take your pick, but that goes for everything. You know, like if you, I mean, I can't think of it. I can't think of a, 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 an example other than what you said that is somehow more masculine than, than football, which is a big grunting sport. But, you know, if you like those things, then you should do it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, it, and, and you should be proud of doing it. And, um, and that goes for anything, you know, you shouldn't have to act one way. You shouldn't have to speak or have certain interests one way or another to be part of the community. So making sure that we're accepting that's on us of people within our own community, but I don't necessarily, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not worried about what Joe UFC thinks about me mm -hmm. like Dick and also liking fight pass, you know, like fuck him if he doesn't like it. Uh, but I, I would, you know, for, for all the times my friends, like even joke that I'm looking for straight approval by liking, for example, mixed martial arts, like, to be honest, also go fuck yourself. I'm just like, I, I'm just liking the things that I like. Who is your favorite mixed martial artist? I wanna, <laughs> just out perhaps, of curiosity. Perhaps whoever's staying in this stereotype, it's definitely Amanda Nunes, who's like the most powerful, um, the world's most powerful lesbian. Uh, hey, I mean, two belts, <laughs> two belts. Um, I mean, I did like, I got into it for watching her because I, I, I watched my first fight at UFC 200, mostly because I hated Brock Lesnar because I'm a, a wrestling fan as well. And I just wanted to see him get his ass kicked, uh, but he didn't, um, even though he cheated um, or he was on, I mean, he was, Juicing, he it out. Yeah, um, but that didn't happen. But what also happened that night is Amanda becoming the first ever queer, uh, lesbian queer champion, and I followed her since then with these just like history-making wins over over Ronda. I mean, 
there is a certain catharsis to her punching a transphobe in the face in like 47 seconds and just humbling her. Uh, and then just uh, uh, like, I've never seen or watched a live sporting event like her beating Chris Cyborg. I've never screamed like I did when that happened. Um, so it's definitely Amanda. And, and that's not just because she's the double champ. I mean, I do think she's one of the greatest of all time, but mm-hmm. her, her, her entire affect uh, when it's uh, remains joyful. Uh, I mean, watching her on social media is a joy. She's very proud of who she is. So I find her to be a role model in addition to being again, one of the greatest of all time. I think too, one thing that, and just when I've, when I've kind of hear you speak or when I I've read interviews in the past, you, you use a lot of fight metaphors, even in commanders in crisis. I think you say (laughs) one of the hardest things about writing is just like in fighting. It happens before that first punch is thrown. And after you know me, desperate for straight approval. But, yeah. <laughs> but I guess what I wanted to ask is, you know, you do, you do kind of have that mentality or that approach. It, it seems like it's, it's kind of like your work is going into the preparation before you even type or hit the first key. And I think that it's just sort of interesting when I sort of hear these things that you throw out and then I kind of see the approach when I read your writing. Do you think that you have kind of that fighter's mentality? I think I like things. I think I like fun turns of phrase. Uh, No, but I mean, the reality, but that is true, though. The reality is, at least in that specific thing that I I mean, I do that comparison because I do find it to be true. I mean, pre-work and outlining, that's where all the real work is in writing many times, you know, um, except in the granular moments. And I learned that at DC because a lot of the work happened before we ever put like page one, panel one to the page. Um, you know, the question, ask, questioning yourself and interrogating yourself to, to find where your story was letting water out uh, is so important. And a lot of people don't think that. And, and that you know, I, it was important for me to say that specific thing because there is a world where, you know, you do the Stephen King style and you sit down and it just comes out. And and if you can do that, that's amazing. I'm, I, I would only stand in awe of those folks. But in my experience, it's a lot of work before you even sit down to write. Um, and I hesitate to say the like, you know, there, there's a common adage where like, you know, oh, the re, you know, writing is just as much work as art because you're doing it on. No, that's bullshit, too. Like, like, I mean, like, the, the, that's why I always try to mention everyone in my creative team, because everything they do takes a lot more physical time uh, and probably an equal amount uh, of, of mental work. Um, but people don't think about the fact that, yes, a lot of writing does happen before the actual thing you're going to turn in goes down. Uh, when you want to have something that's tight and, you know, knows what a narrative is and, and makes sense. So it now being the final week of February, March, right around the corner. March is a very, very, very exciting month for you and for comic book fans who have been waiting for this news for years. You are making your Marvel debut with Man-Thing, correct? Yeah, I've got, I'm approving the colors right after this podcast, actually. Ooh, so. Exciting. So again, obviously, first and foremost, congratulations on that. And I know that this is probably at this point in your career, business as usual, but being that it is, I would presume a lifelong dream that you're now going to be kind of taking on. Do you still get nervous for things like this at this stage in your career? Is it just business as usual? Is it a combination of the two? Well, uh, I mean, first of all, finally going to Marvel is not business as usual uh, because I've never done it before you know, and I'm not so hollowed out in my soul after five years that I don't get excited about working on new properties um, and and for new opportunities and doing new things. Um, And, you know, I, so as a young adult, I was mostly a DC person, but as a child uh, and, 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 and adolescent, I, you know, all of my first books are Marvel books. The first book I ever bought was West Coast Avengers 16. Uh, the, the, that was the first time I almost got in, but it, it was at a flea market. And the second time I almost got in for good was in 90, the early 90s. And it was the Clone Saga. It was Web of Spider-Man. So um, from a Walden books, I mean, the, the key factors here, I had no place to regularly get comics or I would have been in from the time I was two instead of from the time I was 12. But the point remains, um, 
you know, these, I mean, I have a fucking scarlet spider sweater that I cut the sleeves off of. That's, that's my look that hasn't gone up on Instagram yet. So, I mean, I, yeah, of course it's not business as usual. Um, Cause I'm fine. You know, there is, there is something auspicious. Uh, and my time at Marvel has been amazing. Um, so absolutely not. Uh, but that said, come back to what we were talking about before um, the time for you to be a fan and, you know, and, and, and have those moments, you have to make time for those moments. But once you get done with that, you have to sit down and you have to work the outline and you have to go just as hard at the story as you would anything else. And then so that by the time you do sit down to write it, yeah, it is business as usual because you are a creator. That is your job. Your job isn't to be a fan. So it's not, it's absolutely not. Um, but what I have learned is to ha- know, take, know when to put that time to be excited and to fanboy out and all those things. Uh, and then to get in to do the work. Because if those two things blend, uh, I think I'm failing you and I'm failing everybody uh, that, you know, is buying a book that wants a great story. Um, So it is very exciting. And the stuff, I mean, especially, I mean, Man-Thing and then doing this um, Magneto and the Mutant Force uh, one shot in May, which ended up being an allusion to maybe one of my favorite X-Men issues ever, which is uh, Quiet Psychic Rescue in Progress, the Nuff Said issue of New X-Men. Um, I mean, yeah, my, my fan scale is off the charts, you know, but I, I, I do that when the right time is. And then I put it away when it's time to do the book, because my sole obligation is to deliver the best possible work I can, not like thumb my own ass about the fact that I'm writing Magneto. Uh, that's just how it is. Uh, and so, yeah, we, I, I approach the Marvel stuff and the DC stuff the same way I do originals. The key is to just know who these characters are, to challenge them and tell a story that at the end of it, readers know more about them uh, and love them even more than before. And to do that, honestly, I've found at DC, you have to take your fan hat off um, because when you're a fan, you already love something. You already know why. As a creator, you have to step back and be like, oh, how did you get there? How do I tell a story that does for the next reader what that story that made me a fan did? But you can't skip that process or people don't know why the things that are happening are cool. They don't know why they should love a character. They just know you love them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's not enough. I think folks deserve better. So that's what I'm trying to do. And again, just you just keep on rolling into my next question. So this is wonderful. With the news on Magneto, first and foremost, I thought the tease that you did on Instagram with the Magneto shirt was absolutely perfect. <laughs> Well, they're still coming. I, I, at this point, I'm locked into buying a shirt for every new concept I work on. So keep an eye out for my Toxin shirt when Planet of the Symbiotes comes out. Uh, I'm doing a new host for Toxin. It's supposed to be in March. I just saw it's moving to April um, to, along with the end of uh, King of Black. And uh, they'll, they'll keep going. Uh, I guess, you know, maybe some subtle hints on Instagram, depending on what I'm wearing. But this, I'm not doing like Charlotte's Web or something today. This is not a spoiler. Fair enough. Fair enough. Does your approach to your creative process at all change when you are speaking from the perspective of like a classic villain like Magneto, as opposed to a classic superhero like Batman, for example? Honestly, no, because in either situation, our job is to do the research on the character and find out who they are uh, and and then put that on the page. Uh, You know, and that goes for heroes, that goes for villains, it goes for every supporting character. Mm -hmm. Um, In some ways, it's probably easier on work for higher stuff because, you know, on a book like Commanders in Crisis, well, I have to, to be frank, I mean, I have to make up all that history for, Mm -hmm. for those characters. We're making it up in real time, how they would react to things. Um, how they would go about their lives. But if you're writing Batman, you have 80 plus years of reference about how he does things, some of which is contradictory, of course, but that's the way it goes. Uh, and, and the same with Magneto, you know? Um, there's like, and with any type of characterization, uh, you know, you have sort of the, you have a Venn diagram and it's very large on the things that they would actually do. And then you have things that are out of character. So you have to know what to weed out. But yeah, no, I mean, regardless, any character you're taking on, the job is no matter what they do, it's about finding their core. And then once you know that, you can like, boom, you can shoot story through it, like you shoot light through a prism and you, and you find out how they would react to things. No, oh, I, and I think that that's just very, very interesting to kind of gain that perspective from your end. 
Um, if I can now, because I know that we've kind of talked at length and, and in depth at, about a, a few different things. So I kind of just wanted to, to back off a little bit here and, and just kind of get a few more personal questions thrown out your way if, if, I, if I could. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you've been, you moved to Boston in 2018. Is that correct? Yeah. And you're a Syracuse boy from originally. Is that also? Syracuse, right? but I can, lived as an adult in the 518, as you might see, uh, <laughs> for a long time. So, so I but guess, yeah. but I guess the, what I'm asking is how did it feel as, uh, you know, a New Yorker moving to Boston the year that they won the World Series. <laughs> yeah, why don't you ask someone from New York if I'm a New Yorker uh, being from Syracuse and see how that goes. Um, <laughs> people, people who think that like White Plains is upstate New York have no idea that where I live is six hours away uh, from New York City. Uh, luckily though, I, um, I actually have no strong opinions about baseball, despite my father being a, a huge baseball fan and us being a Yankees family. And ironically, him having played on a Blue Jays farm team back in the day. Uh, but the issue, so, so I get by in Boston because I'm just like, man, I don't really care either way. But then when I tell them I don't like cheaters, it doesn't really go over well with Patriots fans. That's where I really, <laughs> that's really where I really hit the skids. Um, but it was fine in that respect. The biggest issue moving to Boston was the, uh, lack of a single good bagel in this entire fucking city. <laughs> Uh, but otherwise it's been great. And the seafood is off the chain. If you want to talk about food, there are you know, pluses and minuses to any city, but like along with when I go to LA, um, I've never, I mean, th th anytime you get fish anywhere here, it's, it's outstanding. So there are great things here, but they're just different, you know, and I get my bagels overnighted from New York and that's how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I also wanted to ask you, um, just to maybe kind of gauge a little bit of more of your story and where you came from, would you be able to just talk briefly about kind of the impact that Stephen T. Siegel has had on your career? Yeah, I mean, Siegel's my mentor. He met me when I was 12. So we've known each other now for 23 years, 35. Thank you, old. But um, in queer years, that's like 78. But um, <laughs> That's a true story. When I was when I was started, I, I was in wine retail for 10 years before I was able to quit and just work solely in writing. And I always remember when I turned 25, I had some older queer customers come in and try to dunk on me by asking what it was like going through my midlife crisis at age 25. And I was just like, well, Joe, words, messages from the grave, my friend, I guess. But um, anyway, um, what was Siegel like? Yeah, no, I mean, Steve has known me since I was 12. He uh, has always been incredibly honest with me and, and I'm thankful for that. I think I tend to be a little louder and a little more gruff or brusque than other creators about the creative process. But that's because I was mentored by someone who had like zero, like 0.0% 0 .0 bullshit when it came to things. You know, even when I was 12, I would bring him scripts uh, at first, and then eventually pitches as the years would go on. Every year I'd meet him at San Diego Comic-Con and I would have scripts and he would say, well, this, you know, he wouldn't really waste time on what was good. That's what my parents were for. Uh, he would say what had to be better and say, all right, come back next year, fully expecting that I wouldn't because I was one of any number of people that he would say this to, but I kept fucking coming back. Um, and he, you know, there was never any malice in his critiques, but he didn't waste time on shit that I didn't need to hear, he, you know, and so that's how I've sort of come up. And it was very brusque. I tend to not sugarcoat people uh, when it comes to breaking into comics. And that's because of him. I don't know how many times I would. <sighs> Hopefully it's empowering for people to hear, you know, looking at me now, but like, I don't know how many times I would call him, uh, especially you know, after I got out of high school, I was in college and just complained about how it happened yet, how it hadn't happened yet. And how I'd, you know, I'd worked for 10 years and it was, I was supposed to happen. Shouldn't it have happened by now? And he would say, well, you know, no, nobody's entitled. You're not entitled to a job in comics because no one is. And then I would whine some more and he would say, that's fine. You can just quit. And that became so enraging to me because I'm stubborn and Italian that I would then not quit for another year. Um, and that is very much how I am with things, uh, for better or worse, uh, because of him. But I, it's, it's been beneficial. You know, I don't, I romanticize what should be romanticized about the creative process, and I don't romanticize what I think is unfruitful to do so with. Even when I was a kid, 
he would he around maybe by the time I was 14, he said, you know what? I mean, if you want this to be your job, write every day, treat it like a job, or it'll never be one. The end. And so I'd never been a person, you know, I I I had one of my jobs, it doesn't matter which one, I had a peer who was trying to be a novelist, and he would say, you know, Steve you know, how do you work 14 hours here and go home and write every night? I need to like go get a cabin in the woods and light some candles. And after a couple of days, maybe I could start writing, you know, of, of a complete silence. And I was like, well, I just go home and do it because that's the time I have and I want to do it. And I'll never forget. He said to me, well, that's why you're a professional and I'm an artist. And um, he still has been published 10 years later. So I mean, it sounds like I'm joking, but that, that stuff like that is because of Siegel. Like, I get very fanish and very excited about the, uh, where it's appropriate. But when it's time to do the work, because of him especially, I sit down and do the work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and that's always how he's been. Uh, and, and a lot of my work ethic and, and my attitude, which is, you know, compassionate, but not Sugar coating, sh- sugar coating, not hand holding, uh, is because of him. No, and I mean, I think that that's. <laughs> I, I, would... I, I, I will only laugh and say, uh, my my friend who works panels and cons with me, when those things existed pre pandemic, uh, told me once that I'm kind but not very nice, and I actually think that that's a hundred percent true, uh, and that's probably because of Steve. He would probably gladly take that uh take that compliment as well so basically there may be a few kids walking away with uh tear-stained cheeks if they come up to you at the con booths and ask you to read their book is that uh (laughs) no because that's not i mean that's not kind but i'm not going to lie to i I don't lie to anyone you know when people ask me now like how they can get I guess the best example, just because it's true, is like people like, oh, well, I have this script. How do I how can I get an editor to look at it? You can't like big two editors don't have time to read spec scripts or legally can't. And that is a challenge. You have to find an artist to draw that script and collaborate with them to get it out. But I think it's more important for them to hear the reality than to be like, well, find the right one. And maybe don't know. Ninety nine percent of the time they will not. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather tell you what's going to help you, you know, Uh, and not in a mean way. But if you if something if. If flight is impossible, I'm not going to say just keep trying. Yeah. You're not going to tell us to keep flapping our wings. And <laughs> you know, I would rather say buy a fucking airplane. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and there's no better example than that. So I'm not, yeah, no, absolutely not. I'm, I'm always encouraging to people, but in the ways that matter, I guess. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, another thing that I wanted to ask you, because I follow you on social media, you know, I'm on your Twitter, I'm on your Instagram. And anyone who follows you regularly definitely knows that you probably have one of the better bodies in comics, I would say. There's kind of a stereotypical idea of what a comic book writer looks like, and you definitely don't conform to that from a physical standpoint. And you haven't had Kevin Wada on this podcast, but, (laughs) but all right. So what do you, I guess what I'm, what I'm saying for, uh, for a pear shaped fellow like myself, what would, what would be the first step that you would recommend for me to kind of whip myself into shape? I mean, it depends. There's no, there's no, um, magic bullet. Uh, I myself, because of my heredity and the way my body chemistry works, uh, have always struggled with gaining weight very easily. Um, so for me, the big change was, you know, getting one of those and, and I'm also, and I also like to have a lot of data and feel in control and that's not for everybody. So for me, I use an app called lose it. Uh, and I sat down and I started playing with my macronutrients, which is how much protein, uh, fats and carbs I eat every day. Uh, not necessarily like, oh, I'll only eat like vegetables. I can get them a lot of different ways, but I started finding the right balance for me. Um, but you can broadly look up, there's three types of body types that I can't remember off the top of my head, but you can look it up. Uh, and I started that with that as a base, uh, along with, you know, at that time, you know, pretty regular exercise, but what it was would vary. And I started that with a base, uh, and just made sure that I was eating within those, those, those constraints, which are going to be different for everyone. So that's why I say, uh, there's no magic bullet. Um, and not even that has to work for everyone. My boyfriend uses, uh, more monitors, calorie density, because we both have struggled with, uh, our size in the past. 
so he's on a completely different style than me. It's, you know, looks, measures things completely differently and it works for him. Um, and then, yeah, you know, like I, I at, at minimum, uh, back before the pandemic was going to the gym five, four times a week. And then on the days that weren't, I would do something, whether it was like yoga for 20 minutes or just something to stay active. Um, but again, there's so many variables. So it's more about like talking to your doctor and finding out what might work for you. I probably, you know, if I didn't have a sedentary job, my answer would be totally different. Half the reason my office, which you can't see below me is filled with exercise equipment is because even when I don't go to the gym, like in the pandemic or on the days that I'm off, uh, you know, I'm sitting in this chair working. If I was working a retailer job or something, I would be on my feet all day and mm -hmm. it would be completely different. The amount of food that I would eat would be different everything would be different. So there's no one magic solution. But what I would say is, is find your goals and, you know, talk to whether it's a trainer. Uh, I mean, that was my first stop uh, and see what they think is reasonable. And like, if you're a person like me that wants to be in control, like this app works for me because I, I want to know, like, if I do gain, if I am, if I do gain weight, uh, like on a given day, I want to look at it and be like, oh, maybe this is why, rather than guess it just happened, um, you know, uh, and, and that, but that's what works for me. For other people, it might be stressful, you know, to always be reporting everything. And then, mm -hmm. then maybe you find something different. You find something like Noom, which is a, which goes by calorie density, or maybe you, I mean, don't do that at all. Maybe you just try to cut back on certain things of what you eat and you up your exercise. I can't say one specific thing because it's not just like, oh, this is, it's not, you know, you plenty of videos are like cut 500 calories a day. That doesn't work for me personally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Cause it's not just what you're doing physically. It's what's going to work and make you feel good mentally as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that took years, by the way, like I have, I mean, again, for folks that it will help, like I have, yo-yoed up and down throughout my life and i've been much much thinner than this actually but it was wildly unhealthy when i was in my early 20s you know i was eating like a can of tuna fish and a can of beans a day and running an hour and a half every day and it sure worked but i would probably be dead right now if i didn't change that so uh and i you know that was 15 years ago and i'm still here so i did change it and i found something that worked for me and maybe it's not exciting that i can't just be like do this but it really is like a lifestyle change means finding something that is sustainable, talking to professionals and, and finding something that you can live with. Because there are plenty of things I'm personally very suspect of like going on keto diets or things like that, because a lot of those things like hacking your body will work, but you can never go off them. And, and personally, I wonder if it is healthy long term uh to to have your body in like a in a reactive mode like that so it might take longer i mean i've it's been three years since i started going back to the gym regularly but you also want to have something that you can feel good about you can fit into your life and you feel like you can do and you feel like it is a healthy it is a it is a health lifestyle change versus a quick fix or like you're torturing yourself or things like that a lot of those things will work you know uh but they're not healthy um and and I don't personally think you often feel good about them. You know, like if I, if I only ate egg white milkshakes every day, that was all I ate, I would probably lose weight, but I wouldn't feel like empowered. I wouldn't feel like I had agency in my own life. So it's complicated, but the first step, yeah, I would sit down. I would, I would, I would sit down either on video or something uh, with uh, probably even a trainer would be enough to like set you up first and just find something that is achievable um, and once you do that, you can reset your goals. That's what I do, uh, and keep going, but it can't, it isn't just like start running every day for an hour and a half. Uh, because again, like you have to feel like you can do this essentially. I don't mean to make this sound apocalyptic. You should find something that you like doing and that you feel like you can do indefinitely because you want to feel good about being active and you want to feel good about what you eat. And you don't want to feel like you're punishing yourself or torturing yourself. And I've been there, you know, so that hasn't been what's worked for me. And I don't think it really is what's going to work for anyone. That was, that was absolutely perfect. That, thank you. That was, <laughs> that was just excellent. One thing I also wanted to ask you, what is your favorite Werner Herzog film and how has his approach to storytelling, if at all, influenced the way that you write? 
Oh man, my favorite Herzog film. Uh, oh, it's Bad Lieutenant, uh, Port of Call, New Orleans, um, as narrative films go. And then it's, uh, is it called Into the Inferno? The Volcano one, uh, yeah. as documentaries yeah. go. Um, I mean, the way that Herzog has actually influenced me is to give up necessarily on being a commercial success every time, you know, I, 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 I which sounds bizarre, but like, reading his books, his, uh, his interview books, and also just looking at him, like a lot of the people that I look up to sometimes have commercial success, but they're so obsessed with doing things that are true to them that sometimes they don't. And, and I've just got to accept that. I, I came to a point where I was like, oh, everybody that I want to be like, you know, is like a sign curve of whether or not um, uh, everyday folks, even though they put something out. And I don't want to go, I don't want to dip that far down. But I've come to accept that if I really am my own North Star, sometimes something won't connect uh, with everyone. And that's fine. Uh, and that's really what I've taken from him. And, you know, special uh, special mention goes to Fitzcarraldo, which is not my favorite uh, Herzog movie. But I do feel like it's a perfect metaphor for the comics industry. Uh, you know, pushing a giant boat over a mountain for no reason uh, is what I feel like often. Uh, when I'm in the weeds. So not my favorite Herzog, but that image of Kinski, like gripping his head with madness. It's like me five days a week. Um, so, and I do love, and, and otherwise I just love like, I mean, the mad energy he has as a creator. I mean, you know, the, the, the best Herzog stories are about him, he himself being so melodramatic. In some ways I wish that I, I don't, I don't wish I had the relationship he had with Kinski with someone else because it was in, it was, it was madness, you know, but just imagine like in a romantic, the world is in real sense, like working with someone and having them maybe storm off the set, pulling a gun on them and being like, <laughs> if you leave, I'm going to, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> but then I'd have to shoot myself because I just killed the greatest living actor. Like, just imagine that on Newsarama, like Steve Orlando calls Riley Rossmo and is like, I have to send you a mail bomb if you don't do this book. But if I do send you a mail bomb, I'm going to have to jump out of my window because you'll be dead. Like, imagine how much people would think I cared about comics then. <laughs> Going back to what you had mentioned about sometimes getting poked fun at or trolled for things that maybe aren't traditionally as popular who would be on your Mount Rushmore of professional wrestlers? <laughs> uh, I mean, how many people are on Mount Rushmore? Four, four. So we'll do, we'll do top four, top four. Why not? I mean, it's hard. If you're talking all time, all time, let's say from Hogan up until I'd... Hogan, Hogan's not on it. <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> Uh, so it'd probably have to be Antonio Inoki, um, Dusty has to be on it, uh, Dusty Rhodes, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> as much as he was never my guy, Stone Cold has to be on it, um, even more than Hogan in a lot of ways, um, not the least of which is that he hasn't revealed himself to be a huge racist later in life. Um, and then it's really tough. Uh, I mean, there's an effort to say like Sam Martino, just because of everything he did, uh, that'll basically never be equaled, uh, because we're in the post kayfabe era, but I don't know. I mean, I kind of put him in the vein, like if I'm going to put a classic wrestler on there. It's got to be dusty. Uh, and I do think that as a, Dusty is maybe the best promo in the history of wrestling. Um, man, I'm not sure otherwise. I feel like I should. Uh, I feel like I should jump up a notch now and and probably it's a cheat, but I would probably have to put like in one spot, the four horsewomen, uh, because there really wouldn't be the mainstreaming, the mainstreaming. I'm not going to say there wouldn't be women's wrestling because women's wrestling has always been great on the indies, but there wouldn't be the mainstream of women's wrestling without them. So it's a cheat. I don't want to attribute it to any one of them. There's four of them, but you wouldn't have 
the historical moment in the biggest company that exists, whether or not it, it in of itself is bad without them. So they, they got to be on there. And that's a little bit of a cheat. You know, I guess if I had to pick one, um, I'd be hard pressed not to pick Becky because she was the breakout. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess for the purposes of being four, I will say Becky. Uh, but also, you know, she made that opportunity herself. And that's something I really, ex- really uh, respect. Uh, they all work their asses off. But the spot she got where she became, you know, she became really became Becky Lynch was an accident. I mean, she got her face broken by Nia Jax and, and she leaned into it. And that image of her in the crowd, that's her forever. You know, that's 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 her um, in the same way that like. Austin shooting the milk, shooting the beer truck is like, you know, always going to be him or giving the middle finger like so. I, I guess special mention to her and she is number four because she really took an op- made an opportunity out of something that couldn't be and not just an opportunity like became probably the most over women's wrestler of that year. Uh, and when she comes back, she'll probably continue to be, mm-hmm. to be honest. All right. That's a good four. That's a good four. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a little hurt that my man Brett, the Hitman Hart didn't make it, but that's OK. I love Hitman. <laughs> he would have gotten the classic spot if not for Dusty. Fair I mean, enough. Uh, Brett was not a talker um, and is a better technical wrestler than Dusty. If we were just talking in ring, it would be different, you know, <laughs> uh, but you, you, you didn't say that. Uh, the, the Fair in-ring, enough. The in-ring top four is, is, is vastly different. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now we're approaching the kind of end of our time together. So if it's okay with you, I would just like to close out with some rapid fire questions, because one thing that I noticed in the preface of um, Commanders in Crisis. There's a very, very nice blurb written about you by Dan Didio, um, who basically says that you have an encyclopedic knowledge when it comes to comic books. And I thought it might be fun. I thought it might be fun to maybe put some of that to the test, if that's okay with you, if you're up for a little game. I'm up for it. I can't make any guarantees, but I'll try. I will say that my knowledge is about lore and not about like, so so there may be... excuse me, things that I'm just automatically bad at. I'm definitely a guy that can like run down everybody who's been the flash, but I'm not a guy who can tell you what year the flash debuted or who drew that issue. So okay. it, kind of, it kind of depends, but within like in universe lore, yes, I tend to uh, be pretty into it. So hit me. Okay. Okay. So we'll start off with this. What was wonder woman's original name? I mean, I mean, I'll be honest. I have no idea. Uh, you, was this you were talking about when Marston was creating her? Yeah, before she was known as Wonder Woman, what did she go by? I am happy to say that it's outside my realm of expertise, but I'm interested. Suprema. That is what I mean. It's funny because there was a character Amazona that debuted a couple uh, months before her, but I had never heard of Suprema. Anyway, as I said, I have. I have a very specific window that I that I know, but I will gladly continue to play. Fair enough. Fair enough. What is the spiciest food in the DC universe? Oh, that's Green Arrow's chili. <laughs> you got that one right. That is correct. What is Batman's favorite food? I actually don't know that. I have a couple references in my head. Um, but for the sake of pleasing uh, Lego Batman fans, I will say Lobster Thermidor. <laughs> you know what? That answer is way better than the one that I have because I think it's fake. Mulligatawny soup is apparently the answer that, that they've given on this trivia. Now, the last one, and then we will say goodbye. Which supervillain was once the Iranian ambassador to the United oh, Yates? Nations? Sure. I don't you don't even have to. That's death, that's death in the family. Because that is some wild shit. I don't even have to. You know, <laughs> I recently reread that and I was sending screen caps to Tynan. As like there's like nine panel grids of him like screaming at the UN. It's fucking, it's fucking wild. That story is wild. All right. Well, Steve Orlando, that about brings us to the end of our comic conversation today. It has been a privilege speaking with you, and I just can't thank you enough. And Just thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm happy to do it. And we'll be looking forward to your Marvel debut next month. Keep on reading along in Commanders in Crisis and 
follow Steve Orlando on Instagram, Twitter, um, because like he had said, we're going to be seeing more of those teases coming along. So Steve, thank you. And I hope you have a great day. I will. You do it.